We're back for our annual Game Jam devlog. Ignore the fact that I haven't actually posted one of these in over two years. Dennis and I did work on two different Game Jams in the meantime, but we just never created anything notable enough to inspire a video. But you're watching this now, which means that either this game was notable enough to make a video on, or I've slowly lowered my standards to the point where just about anything will make the cut on this channel. I mean, I did make an Among Us Fall Guys crossover animation, so perhaps I shouldn't speak too soon. Back on topic though, this year's Global Game Jam was admittedly quite a while ago. Since starting this channel, both I and my brother that make these games with me have been employed full time in the games industry. However, we took time to hunker down for a solid 48 hours of game making, and we're finally back in the swing of devving things. And I don't just mean smaller one-offs, but you'll hear more about that later. As a rundown for those unaware of how game jams work, there are events where teams or even solo devs can take part in creating a small game. The only rules are that it must fit a general theme given during the event, and that it must be completed within the given time frame, in this case being 48 hours. Previous examples of themes include Duality, where we created a point-and-click romance game about two different characters in different situations, and Lost and Found, where we created a kooky PS1-style horror game about finding your lost home in a strange and surreal array of randomly generated worlds. Luckily for us, the theme for this year was announced a day in advance, so that would mean we could consider the general game plan ahead of time. What was the theme we were given, you ask? Well, drum roll, please. Make me laugh. This ended up not really sparking inspiration from the get-go, so I was initially quite worried about our prospects, but we kept churning out ideas and eventually one stuck. With the theme we were given, there was only one thing I knew had to stick, and that was that I wanted to draw funny clowns somehow. I've got a bad case of clussy fever. So that's what all our brainstorming revolved around. We had a few concepts thrown around, but the thing about clowns is that they're surprisingly hard to make funny. But since Dennis and I are both cynical, irony-poisoned zoomers, the thing all our pictures had in common was the idea of clowns being in places they shouldn't be. Like our first idea was somehow making a game about a clown doing its taxes. Yeah, we didn't get very far on that one, but the visual was kind of funny, right? Next, we got pretty into the idea of a clown going to court. The gameplay would be centered around a long monologue from the judge about all the crimes the clowns committed, and then you strategically interject with funny antics in order to make the jury laugh, which would result in you being found not guilty. Uh, somehow. Yeah. I think this one could have been pretty funny. With the juxtaposition of the happy clown doing his silly antics along with a stern monologue about the terrible crimes he's committed. But we did like this idea a lot. The issue is that having a monologue at the centre of the gameplay would mean it would have to be long enough to give a sizeable amount of playtime, but also funny enough with lots of amusing spots for the clown to interject with honks and custard pies or whatever. It would have been a toughie, so sadly it didn't quite make the cut. Finally, however, we hit upon the idea we ended up wanting to work with. Here's the blueprint. You're a kid walking around your house at night, but you're not alone, because your house is infested with the worst pests imaginable. Clowns? Your goal is to scare them away as they slowly appear around the house, hiding behind the sofa, coming through the window, on the TV, etc. You have to last five minutes with things getting harder and harder, and if you're caught, jump scare. A cute one though, like the clown honks a horn in your face. And we'll call it Five Minutes at Frillies, because we are very original. With the plan set, we began to bide our time, waiting for the... So... With the blueprint out of the way, we got to work on phase one, building the map. We opted for the visuals to be a 2D, 3D hybrid, because I really had a hankering to make stuff like that again ever since Wrong Stop. So that means the map will be 3D and the characters and objects will be flat 2D planes, like Paper Mario. First things first, I started to make a wall. I wanted it to look fun, so I thought of all the clowny things I could muster and made a mirrored design that loops. It's got everything. Butterflies, rainbows, music notes, giant menacing clown faces peering over the skirting board, flowers, you know, the obvious. Then we added a window or two in anticipation for some fun hiding spots. As for the floor, I was a bit lazier and just used a carpet texture and posterized it a ton, just so it's detailed enough to not look bland. Hey, got a good corner somehow. Next is the fun part, making the characters. I ended up designing two clowns, as we decided to expand the gameplay a bit more than just looking for Freddy Fazbear until 6am. This led me to designing three characters. Frilly, the titular clown you need to catch before he jumps out at you. The protagonist, Millie, who's a young girl that doesn't like clowns even when they aren't doing a B&E on her home. Then there's Harold. Harold's also a clown. But he's not so easily spooked as his lanky counterpart, and will actually bring the fun to you by chasing you down the hall on occasion, before disappearing for a future surprise attack. Also, is it just me, that these guys look kinda familiar? With the basic room and characters made, we can build the map. Looking at it, however, there's something you're probably thinking. Hey, wait a minute. Why is everything black and white? These aren't clowns, they're... mimes. But hold on just a sec. I haven't clickbaited you. This is all part of the plan. 
hang on and let Dennis cook. This will be explained later. While Dennis is getting the movement working, I continue to make the furniture. Each piece will be a unique hiding place, so it's important to make a large enough variety. I started with a sofa with the intention of making everything look a little bit clown inspired. You can kind of see with the patches and cross stitches on the front that looks like Frilly's eyes. Originally, I hoped to make some wacky hiding places like the sofa itself slowly turning into a big Frilly face. But spoiler alert, that ended up being way too much feature creep. So we kept it mostly simple, aside from one or two surprises you'll see later. By the end, there was a total of 13 pieces of furniture that Frilly could hide behind. These are the sofa, TV, painting, two lamps, two windows, two rugs, two lights, and two plants. We kind of doubled up on a few of them, but remember this game is being made in two days. After I finished these, Dennis assembled them in the map, spacing out the duplicates to feel natural without repeating too obviously. Speaking of things repeating though, you may wonder how the player is able to reach Frilly in time if they're both on opposite ends of the map. Thankfully, we considered this in advance. This is Frilly's funhouse after all, we're all just living in it. So the hallway actually loops endlessly. This task pretty much took the rest of Dennis's day after getting Millie moving. So at the end of the day, we had most of the art complete, a moving character, and a looping furnished hallway funhouse. At this point, we're officially halfway through the time we have. We've done a pretty good effort, but will everything be wrapped up for the- Okay, now that all the main elements are in the game, it's time to explain why the entire thing is in monochrome. Since this is a game about kooky clowns, I thought that it would be a cute gimmick that over the course of the five minutes, the game gets even more weird and wild. One of the ways we ended up doing this is by having everything very gradually shift in hue. And the best way to achieve that is to first make all the assets in grayscale and then apply the colors in engine. So what starts as a blue hallway will gradually shift to green, then yellow, then red, and finally purple. With each object starting at slightly different hues as well, so they don't all just blend into each other as much. Now we can make all those aforementioned kooky clowns colorful. This also has a small effect on gameplay, as we wanted the enemies to stand out early on. So we began by giving them complementary colors to their surroundings. This meant beginning them as yellow on a blue background, but then slowly pulling their colors toward the color of the environment to better hide them. So by the end, Frilly is the same purple color as the wall behind him like a chameleon. It's a minor way to make the game harder, but a cute one nonetheless. Lastly, we opted for Millie to actually keep her monochrome sleepy goth look, as it ended up suiting someone who was very much not down to clown. By this point in the project, while Dennis was working on getting Frilly's behavior to work, I ended up just being sat beside him making stupid noises since most of the art stuff was done. And much like a tired parent, he booted me to my room and told me to find something productive to do. And that gave me an idea. What if I made it so he couldn't avoid my silly noises? After all, the characters did need some sort of voice, right? And thus, I found my calling as a voice actor, channeling Mario through the lens of a small, frightened animal. Ho ho! Wahoo! Beautiful. As for Harold, he was very much the Wario to Frilly's Mario, similar to how his name is ill-fitting to the rhyming nature of the others. I thought it would be funny to make him sound out of place too, with the deep, off-putting chuckle of a perverted Frenchman. <laughs> for additional audio, I searched for plenty of free sounds online for things like footsteps, clown honks, and the like and I found the constant ticking clock in the background matching the timer added a really good bit of atmosphere, also adding a bell chime that sounds off after each minute to emphasize each phase of the game, marking when the scenario slightly changes in difficulty and enemies. The music was something I ended up being really pleased with, honestly. I searched for creepy clown music and found one that I was a big fan of, then I trimmed and looped it to better work over the five minutes. That's when I had the idea to gradually distort it over the course of those five minutes as well, speeding up the music and pitching it slightly with each loop. This, combined with the colour shifting, really nicely captured the vibes of a nightmarish funhouse. And looking at all the things together, they're really coming out exactly as I'd hoped. Hold on a second though, who's that skulking in the background? Looks like Frilly's also working, and has begun hiding in random spots around the map. And each time the player catches him, he disappears and reappears on another randomly chosen object. We even give him a bit of cartoon logic, like how he's hiding behind the lamp here. And since he's quite static throughout the game without much animation, I chose to design three distinct poses that he can switch between, just to give him a bit more life. I also took the time to animate a three-frame walk cycle for Millie and Harold. It's impressive what you can get away with with limited animation. Much like Mario in the original games, they're broken into only two poses on either side with a single in-between. For my last piece of important work, there's something we've been neglecting up until now with this Five Nights at Freddy's parody, and that's the jump scares. These were done pretty simply just by going into the different poses for Frilly and Harold respectively, applying some motion blurs they rush in from the side to make them look really fast, before getting into the player's face with the sound of clown horns honking. I obviously wasn't intending to make them actually scary, since we wanted this to be a parody of a horror game, but they might give you a little surprise if you're already panicking. And hey, they're probably still better than the ultimate custom night jump scares. 
And finally, just before the finish line, with a few hours left to go, we did some finishing touches with the audio I'd created of that day to save the game from deafening silence. Just in time for... FINISH! And that's a wrap for the official Game Jam timer. Now, let's see what we have to show for it. Well, Frilly and Millie both work 100%, and the game ends at 5 minutes. But it's pretty anticlimactic and not very hard. Also, that timer is going to drive me crazy. Harold is there too. He's unfortunately not at the stage he actually chases the player, so he just kind of hung around. That's probably the most unfortunate bit, as the game without him isn't very difficult. <sighs> if only there was some way to... Wait, why is the video not over yet? Alright, maybe just one more day. This one's dedicated almost entirely to Harold, with a little bit of polish in other areas. One nice bonus we did was to add a tutorial screen explaining how the game works as controls. We also showed the controls for both keyboard and controller. Except I kind of forgot the control button for closing the screen, but well well, no good dwelling on the past, it's like that forever now. Another thing that goes a long way in making it feel like a fully fledged game is making the main menu. We utilised the hallway's looping function to nice effect and had the background dramatically pan across an endless colour shifting hallway. I'm actually really happy with this. I also made a title which you can see here. After another day of intense coding for Dennis, Harold works. To make it easier to do, we ended up making him only do his appearances at set times after Frilly disappears. He chases you for a varying time and then runs away. As time progresses, he gets faster and faster, so you pretty much have to be prepared as soon as he appears by the end. For the final minute, we also threw everything at the wall, with both Harold and Frilly appearing at the same time. So if Harold cuts you off before you can reach Frilly, you best go around the long way quick, bucko. After this bonus day, there was only a couple minor nitpicks we were sad to have missed. Like giving the painting and TV a unique hiding place of Frilly that wasn't just him coming out from behind it. But alas. With these last changes, the game works, progresses nicely, and we've achieved everything major we sought to accomplish. So that means that we can finally... Oh god damn it. Alright alright, between work we kinda kept coming back to this over and over again. While the game functioned, we just continued trying to button things up to maximise the charm. So. We fixed that weird timer, added those two final hiding places for Frilly so he now appears out of the painting and in the TV like Sadako from The Ring. We even added credits where the characters have a little boogie if you manage to outlast the timer. This rounds things up nicely before the game auto-closes. <sighs> now we're done for realsies, I promise. And you can play the game yourself too for only a dollar if you sign up for our Patreon or drop a donation at our Ko-fi for an easy one-off. There'll also be another way to play the game and maybe some others down the line in what I hope to be the near future. Plus, if you do choose to donate to either our Ko-fi or Patreon, you'll get a thank you at the end of our hopefully less infrequent videos. Like all these kind people, including You Lose Some, Jesso Doodles, Natalie Layton, Venomous Squirrel, and as always, my lovely mum. Thanks, mum. Oh, and one more thing. A special thanks if you actually watched this long, and especially if you've been subscribed during our long hiatus. We have something brewing that we hope you'll be able to see and maybe even be a part of sooner than later.